Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. It's Friday, June 20th, 2014. Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C. here in the early afternoon. And we have uh, two parallel world crises going on. We have the Ukrainian crisis where... Heavy fighting continues to occur. Maybe the uh, Ukrainian fascist regime claims they've killed 300 resistance fighters, anti-fascists, in southeastern Ukraine. Their gas has been cut off. Their bluff has been called. And we want to talk about Ukraine and uh, put that in the context of the uh, Russian seminar held at the Senate and the National Press Club this past Monday and Tuesday. And if you read the Daily Beast, you know that I was there, because they took that occasion to slander me, of course. But that won't won't disturb us. Um, And at the same time, we've got this question of ISIS, the terrorist rebels, the lunatic killers on the march in the Middle East. But of course, the question is, who are they? What are they? But I would prefer to approach both of these from what I think is central and behind them both. In other words, an attempted putsch in the United States, an attempted coup d'etat, a cold coup, a creeping coup, if you like, and the top creep, as usual, General David Petraeus, the man on horseback, the personification of Bonapartism and dictatorship in this country in our time. And this network, the Neocon network, which has now arrayed itself around Petraeus, attached itself to him, uh, is uh, exercising its uh, shrill and strident warmonger tones to the maximum. Now, remember, this is not uh, that new. I think in retrospect, we can say that the Benghazi events of September 11th, 2012, were, to be sure, an attempt by the neocons, the Kagan clan, the Boltons, the Josephs, the Dan Seniors, and so forth, the Max Boots, to try to project Romney into the White House, where he could then be appealed to based on the White Horse prophecy of the Mormons, and uh, this could then have led to early confrontation with Russia. Make no mistake, if Romney had been elected, you'd be in war right now, up to your eyeballs. War in Syria, war in Ukraine, war with Iran, nothing but war, rivers of blood. That's what the Romney neocon combine was offering. And, of course, so many, blinded by their hatred of Obama, decided to go down that road. What what a... Uh, what a shame! What what a uh, what a bankrupt response that was. But the other side of Benghazi, as we now see, is that the warmongers were beside themselves because they wanted to stay in Iraq, and Obama had essentially wrapped up the Iraq War between 2011 and 2012. Practically nothing was left, and that was what the warmongers uh, didn't like. doesn't matter that the actual withdrawal from Iraq was signed by Mad Dog Bush the Younger. They, they choose to ignore these things, right? It's typical hysterical reactionaries and neo-fascists. They, they make up their own reality, right? The world is will and imagination, not, not reality. But you get the idea. So uh, certainly... There was an extra oomph added to the Benghazi provocation, that October surprise that took place in September, under the responsibility of General David Petraeus for the CIA paramilitaries who never intervened, never lifted a finger, and they were at the annex, 30 or 40 of them, more than enough to uh, to brush aside these killers. And then on the other side, General Carter Ham of U.S. African Command, U.S. AFRICOM, who had the jets in Sigonella, Sicily, an hour or two away, could have done a whole bombing job strafing 
brush them aside in that way. So those two, and of course Bolton, the link between the Islamophobia network and the Romney campaign, and the Islamophobia network had produced that film, right? the anti-Islamic provocation film, and don't tell us that that had no effect. There were riots in 30 countries. People got killed because of that film, and that was in Egypt the same day, and so forth. And of course we know that in terms of carrying out the killing, it's not this guy they paraded this time. This is a little fish. It's Kumu, Sufyan Kumu, graduate alumnus of the Guantanamo Bay School of Terrorism, because that's what it is. And when we see the ISIS led by al-Baghdadi, Baghdadi has a four-year degree. It's not exactly uh, Guantanamo Bay, right, the Oxford and Cambridge of this kind of stuff, but uh, he's got a perfectly respectable four-year degree held by the U.S. as a prisoner of war from 2005 to 2009. Maybe he's been through the Abu Ghraib uh, school of, uh, of terrorism. Remember, once the U.S. captures you, you don't get out unless you're brainwashed or you become a double agent. So that would be Kumu. I think uh, al-Ashiri, who had been sent back to Yemen to create AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, I think he's gone the way of all flesh, unless I'm mistaken. Hard to tell with these guys, right, because they live, they live a chaotic life. And, and then, of course, we've got Belhaj in Libya, who was a U.S. prisoner of war until he uh, was uh, released and then sent back, retooled, to fight uh, Gaddafi. So that was Benghazi. That was the, an attempted coup. And now we've got a series of other things. I told you in real time that Bergdahl... The, the furor, the hysteria around Bergdahl, really a trifling incident, was somehow a prelude to making this cold coup go all the way. And you'll remember, I was telling you in real time of who the warmonger clique actually was. It's not Obama. Obama is a weak, passive figure who is struggling to keep himself from being swept away. And, of course, his instincts are all wrong. He sees this as what's good for Obama bad for Obama. He has no sense of history of the national interest. He's a Wall Street puppet, exactly as I told you uh, previously. But um, certainly the idea that Obama is a center of, you know, dynamic criminal energy and aggressive intent. This is somebody who's trying to throw out shucks, shucks and sops to the opposition to prevent impeachment or some some worse uh, fate. So, uh, that is what we're seeing. According to the Washington Post, as we read it to you in real time, the people pushing for an attack on Syria most recently, we know there was a first generation that included Panetta and Hillary and the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that time and the entire Obama staffs, and he said no. Good. Glad that he said no. Make a note of that. And now we've just had Petraea, uh, sorry, uh, Skull and Bones Kerry demanding attacks. This is some months back. This is March, I guess, uh, demanding an attack. And uh, Samantha Power of the humanitarian bombing responsibility to protect school. So Obama has said no to all of that. And you'll remember that um, Petraeus, uh, sorry, once again, uh, Kerry, Kerry and Samantha Power had decided to reach out. And here's where Petraeus finally comes in, that uh, the people they reached out to were General David Petraeus, the personal union of the CIA and the Pentagon, and, of course, General Keene of the Institute for the Study of War. Now, remember what this means. Uh, Petraeus, he was prominent at the Bilderberger meeting a couple of weeks ago in Copenhagen. Charlie Skelton has a nice picture of Petraeus contemplating the world through a window at the uh, Bilderberger meeting and his network and we'll go through the network and that's what's pushing war right now the neocon revival is a Petraeus revival he's the leader of the faction so get that into your head back in a minute Crisis Radio Webster Topley in uh, Washington D.C. Um, there's a good chance that if you're listening to this on Saturday the 21st of June uh, check the schedule of Coast to Coast AM 
for the Saturday night into Sunday morning uh, broadcast there, and I believe it's, there's a pretty good chance that I'll be on there in the first hour talking on uh, about some of these things to do with uh, with Iraq. So coast to coast AM in the night between the 21st and 22nd of uh, June, that means the, the, the shortest night of the year, right, because it's now the solstice. Okay, so remember, Kerry and Samantha Power, Skull and Bones Kerry and Samantha Power, frustrated in their desire to bomb Syria and start a major war. Remember, Samantha Power, her specialty is the weaponization of human rights questions, right, to turn that into a, a bomb, right, R2P, that's that's the bomb that she uh, she likes to throw around. Uh, they reached out to Petraeus and General Keene. Now, who does it mean? This leads us to these neocons that have now been all over the airwaves, right? You've seen it. Richard Pearl is back. Paul Wolfowitz is back. Dick Cheney is back. His mentally deficient daughter is back. Uh, all of them. Krauthammer never went away. Uh, and on and on. And above all, we now see Kimberly Kagan. Kim Kagan, who is obviously, she's got some deep, deep uh, personality problems, but that woman, that that extreme neurotic woman, to put it mildly, was one of the architects of the surge. And we remember the Washington Post, Chandra Sekar, I guess it was, revealed that at a certain point, Petraeus and McChrystal had invited Kimberly Kagan, who heads up the Institute for the Study of War, and... Her husband, Frederick Kagan, the guy that I called Field Marshal Kagan, he's kind of a, a tubby academic of this this uh, family. So Kim Kagan and Fred Kagan were invited over to Iraq by Petraeus, where they became part of the U.S. chain of command. And that's illegal, but they did it. Uh, and they uh, got all the more contributions for it. Now, once we've said the Kagans, right, we've also got to think of Petraeus, accepting an award. He said, oh, some people think I'm a puppet, and the people who run me are the Doctors Kagan. Oh, the Doctors Kagan. And remember, of course, that the brother of uh, Field Marshal Fred Kagan is Robert Kagan at the Brookings Institution. He is was top, top foreign policy advisor, top foreign policy advisor to Romney. And this is, of course, the Robert Kagan, who's married to the charming Victoria Newland, whose vulgarity and uh, barbarity have uh, made, uh, they've disgusted the entire world. Uh, and of course, uh, Fred Kagan is at the American Enterprise Institute. Kimberly Kagan runs the Institute for the Study of War. She was on uh, C SPAN in the past week with her neurotic tics well on display. Right? She doesn't know where to look. She looks all over the place. She's obviously, she's got a bad conscience. And a lot of the callers on C-SPAN were saying, you know, how dare you come out from under your rock, you neocons. You are the most hated faction in modern American history after what you did. And now you come forward. How dare you? She said, oh, well, the Institute for the Study of War does not advocate war. We don't advocate war. We just want our policymakers to have the best possible information. Well, I'm sorry, you do advocate war. And uh, and then, of course, uh, Robert Kagan at the Brookings Institution. So this is a network. General Keene, was, uh, he's all over Fox, right? These people are now mobilized as never before, and they're, uh, they're out there uh, demanding more robust military action. They, they hesitate to spell out what they want, right? They leave this to McCain, right? As we pointed out, 10 days ago, McCain on the floor of the Senate called for Obama to fire his entire team, I guess it means Kerry and Rice and all the rest of them. And again, that's fine with me. But then, says Kane, bring in Petraeus and General Keene. So everybody knows that Petraeus and Keene are the secret wing of Kerry and Samantha Power. Warmongers all. Uh, and of course, when, when McCain gets out there, he's very blunt. He says, I want to bomb Iraq. But then he also says, it's also necessary to bomb Syria, to bomb Syria, because that's where ISIS comes from. <laughs> and, of course, once you're bombing Syria, right, bomb ISIS, bomb Assad, same difference. You get the idea. This is why we're against bombing. Bombing is not good in this situation because the rogue network is too strong, 
and they can redirect the bombing. No bombing of Iraq, because that can easily turn into the bombing of Syria and the, the bombing of the positive factions in Syria, which we reject, and, even worse in some ways, the bombing of Iran. So this we do not want. But the point is, this is the warmonger coalition, and they're everywhere. Right? This is where, for example, here we have... Um, uh, Politico, Thursday, the 19th of June. Crisis in Iraq prompts resurgence of GOP hawks. The other day, I guess it was Thursday morning, we had McCain, Lindsey Graham, this uh, Rubio. Rubio wants <laughs> boots on the ground, as far as I can see, or he wants the door kept open to boots on the ground. Same thing of General of uh, Senator Cornyn. And uh, according to Lindsey Graham, he says, world events have proven McCain, Senator Ayat, Rubio, and other people who have been hawkish. We were right, says mad dog Lindsey Graham, who's now gotten through his primary, so he figures he can shoot his mouth off all he wants. So you get the idea, right? They're everywhere. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's outrageous. And there is blowback, right? There are people who are saying, we never want to see you again as long as we live. But now let's look at a somewhat more sophisticated level. Here we have the Washington Post, Thursday, June 19th. Headline, U.S. sees risk in Iraq airstrikes. And then one of the two stories, Veterans Debate, Did Leaders Fail or Did Iraqis? by Greg Jaffe and Kevin Maurer. And what do we see here? This front page, Washington Post, upper right-hand corner, above the fold, prominent. Uh, in an echo of the post-Vietnam debate, some... Military uh, officers believe that the war could and should have been won. And when you get into this stuff, watch out for this stab in the back story, right? Hindenburg, in 1918, told George Seldes the German army was defeated by the U.S. attack on the, the, uh, the German salient at the Merzagon. That's what defeated. And when, in, when, when Hindenburg was speaking, uh, rationally, he said, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, by the way, it's, it's an, uh, an attack led by General MacArthur uh, and the Rainbow Division at that point. So basically, Hindenburg says, these forces defeated uh, us, and that was uh, MacArthur and those, those people, right, under the command of this rotten uh, Pershing, right, Wall Street general. But later on, Hindenburg turned around and said, oh, no, we were stabbed in the back. The Social Democrats uh, we, you know, they did it. We were never defeated, the Social Democrats. So you got to watch out when you get these rehashes. And here it comes. So Obama blamed for not delivering the fruits of victory. We'll be right back with this Hold That Thought World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. And reminding you that Petraeus has been attending these Bilderberg meetings, and he's accompanied by his money bag. And that is Henry Kravis of Kohlberg Kravis Roberts, a multi-billionaire. So you got on the one side, you got the uh, you know the Koch brothers and Mellon Scaife for the reactionaries, but you've also got Henry Kravis, right? And this this uh, these people are um, friends of the family of the Bushes, right? So take a look at that. Uh, that's in. George uh, H. W. Bush, the unauthorized biography by yours truly, called the Permian Basin Gang. That's where the crevices go back to. And of course, Soros and the Steyer on the other side, right? We do not want to have politics where it's essentially fought out among multi billionaires and everybody else is a pawn, right? This is no good. So, um, the situation of the Petraeus faction attempting a uh, come back in grand style. Part of this is undoubtedly going on at the Bilderberg with the help of the billions of Kohlberg, Kravis, Roberts. And Petraeus works for this thing called the KKR World Institute or something like that. That could very well be a uh, a center from which some of these current events actually emanate. Take a good hard look at that. Um, now, um what I wanted to point to, though, is that the Petraeus networks are super mobilized. Here on the front page of the Washington Post, once again, Thursday, June 19th, we have um, the military faction that blames Obama for failing to harvest the fruits of their wonderful victory in the surge. And, of course, the surge is Petraeus, 
Fred Kagan, Field Marshal Kagan, Kim Kagan. We've got pictures of them walking through the souks way back then. Right? And this was against the will of the American people. 2006 election, get out, wind it down, no more losses. No, said Bush, got to have a surge. And that's Petraeus, right? General Petraeus. And that's where he got his General Petraeus. But now, here we have retired Colonel Peter Mansour, M-A-N-S-O-O-R, who served as a top advisor to General David H. Petraeus in Baghdad and wrote a history of the latter years of the war. This character, obvious flack for Petraeus, quote, Anyone who was there during the surge came away very encouraged about the future of the country if we had continued to stay engaged. Now, this is baloney of the most vulgar species, but you get the idea. It's the stab in the back legend in Fieri, right? It's being created. It's an inchoate version of the legend. And you go over this, how the... Uh, Article says, the chaos in Iraq, this debate, could shape the future of the U.S. military. Will they go big conventional divisions, or will they go drones and special forces, and so forth? And we also get another resurgent neocon here, Elliot A. Cohen, a uh, historian, I guess, of, uh, and he's from uh, was from Johns Hopkins, served as a senior State Department official during the final years of Mad Dog Bush the Younger, and uh, Cohen is among those who believe that Iraq was on a, quote, fragile trajectory towards success before the U.S. withdrawal. In recent days, this is Cohen now, this is interesting. In recent days, Cohen has detected, quote, real anger at the Obama administration, close quote, among senior members of the military, for not pressing the Iraqis harder to accept a long-term U.S. presence. Now, you'll remember what it is. They wanted a status of forces agreement that would give the U.S. Uh, forces immunity, that they'd only be, they wouldn't be tried in uh, Iraqi courts. The fairly standard Maliki said no, and at that point, Mad Dog Bush said in that case, we're leaving. But now they want to blame this on Obama. It's amazing, right? It's the same logic that would make you think that uh, Lois Lerner is somehow the embodiment of uh, the evil demiurge in, in the modern world. Um, and then uh, <laughs> Cohen, however, has to add that the U.S. Army is doing a much worse job of taking a hard look at itself than it did after Vietnam. Anyway, the key point here is the anger. The anger. Now, I would say to those officers... You don't like civilian leadership. You should resign and state your reasons. As Napoleon says, if you don't agree with the strategy, you resign, and then you state your reasons rather than agree to the downfall of your army. And that's what these bums in uniform want to do. But you get the idea. This is why so many generals and admirals had to be fired, in the, including starting with Petraeus himself. And, of course, we've got to remember... Michael Hastings, right, who was delving into this world, right, the world and the, the book that he'd written about McChrystal, right, the commanders, stressing this sleazy um, anti-civilian control mentality, right, making fun of Biden and, uh, and Obama. Okay, but you've got to watch out with that stuff because a military coup is bad news. So this is the, uh, the problem we face. Now, let's look at ISIS specifically. It's a highly artificial entity. First of all, as I think we said last week, the, the, the immediate director and the, the sort of um, leadership figure that is offered to the, the uh, benighted militants of this thing is ARF, Abdul Rahman Faisal, of the Saudi royal family. He's the brother of Prince Saud al-Faisal, the foreign minister, and Turkey al-Faisal, the uh, ambassador to uh, London and uh, Washington at various times. So ARF, Abdul Rahman Faisal, that's the boss. Now, uh, it obviously draws on the U.S., on Negroponte and Ford setting up death squads, but the idea is that in addition to the Saudi leadership and the Saudi money, you've got uh, training 
being provided by the U.S., the CIA, NATO, uh, the British, the French, uh, other facilities being provided by Turkey and Jordan. Here we go, a couple of things now. There was a flurry of articles about this back in March 2013, so 15 months ago. Here we go with Spiegel. This is the German news magazine. Now, rather than try to quote in German, I got the translation here from Reuters. So this is all mainstream. Dateline Berlin. Americans are training Syria rebels in Jordan, says Der Spiegel. Americans are training Syrian anti-government fighters in Jordan, the German weekly Der Spiegel said on Sunday, quoting participants and organizers. Some 200 men have already received training over the past three months, and there are plans to train another 1,200 of the Free Syrian Army. The Free Syrian Army, as far as I can see, has ceased to exist. Some of those guys have fled to Sweden. They've, they've gone back to the hotels where they came from, those lounge lizards. Jordanian intelligence services are involved in the program, which aims to build around a dozen units totaling some 10,000 fighters to the exclusion of radical Islamists, Spiegel reported. Well, <laughs> that part, they were fibbing. <laughs> they lied about that. But the 10,000 is pretty much what we're seeing. So the Jordanian intelligence services want to prevent the Salafists, the crazies, from crossing into Jordan, from, uh, from Jordan into Syria or back, and then returning to stir up trouble in Jordan itself. So you, uh, you get the idea, right? And then they have various uh, self-serving uh, smokescreen stuff from the U.S. side. Here's another one. It's amply confirmed. West training Syrian rebels in Jordan. This is The Guardian, around the same time, 8th of March, 2013, Julian Borger and Nick Hopkins. Exclusive, well, because by that, it may, I guess it wasn't exclusive by that point. UK and French instructors involved in US-led effort to strengthen secular elements in Syrian opposition, say sources. Well, of course, the secular, they fibbed. Uh, and of course, some of these people can be secular Baathists that are going to be retooled as Salafist, uh, Takfiri, crazy. That's perfectly feasible, but you can see what it is. Don't worry about these uh, the little labels they put on these people. This is the 10,000 that have now made up ISIS. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, 20th of June, 2014. Webster Top here in Washington. Okay, The Guardian, West training Syrian rebels in Jordan. March, early March, 2013. 15 months ago, 10,000 people getting uh, trained for this stuff. And remember all that flap about the European Union rules, whether European Union member states were allowed to do this kind of thing and how the rules then left the door open for the British and the French to do it. And, of course, then they, they did it. And this is now the result of that is ISIS. Amazing. Uh, so that's where it comes from. A Jordanian source familiar with the training operations said it's the Americans, Brits, and French with some of the Syrian generals who defected. Uh, and then other, uh, you know, half of these articles is simply uh, verbiage. Um, William Haig, the foreign secretary, uh, confirms it, talked about the goals of it. Uh, there's a planning cell. This is interesting. Planning cell at the King Abdullah II, Jordan, uh, special operations training center north of the capital Amman that may be the uh the center of this thing uh so you get the uh, the idea and the british were uh, putting in uh 40 million pounds 60 million dollars and on and on so and we we've, we've also got then uh, and I'm I refer you for the details on these things you got to subscribe to my twitter feed cuz it's all up there it's all up there and we even have um, the uh, the way in which it's paid for. And this is not just uh, Rezo Voltaire, authoritative though they are. This is now uh, mainstream media. Let's quote you in on uh, just in terms of the money specifically. There was an attempt in the past week to say the money comes from Indonesia. Well, some may, but I think we're going to have to deal with the fact that it's uh, it's the. Uh, the the uh, the Saudis and this is an article here from the Daily Beast right they stopped slandering me for a minute to uh, to come up with this uh, America's allies are funding ISIS 
by Josh Rogan, and this is not only the Daily Beast, but the uh, the uh, Yahoo News has taken this up, and they want you to know here that the uh, the uh, extremists, the extremist group that is threatening the existence of the Iraqi state, ISIS, was built and grown for years with the help of elite donors from uh, supposed allies of the United States in the Persian Gulf uh, region. So it comes from, let's quote exactly from this article, it's obviously going to be uh, the Saudis, an ironic twist, says uh, one of them, but um, coming from the Arab Gulf states, Kuwait, Qatar, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. So it's all there. Paid for by the Saudis, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, trained by the U.S., British, French, with the help of Jordan, with the help of Turkey. This is a complete fraud. All right, now why? Uh, well, uh, first thing is to save the Syrian rebels, right? Syrian rebels on their last legs, Aleppo purged of, of killers, Homs liberated a year after Qusair, and at the same time successful elections at a pretty good level of formalism uh, as far as elections go, organized by Assad and the Syrian Ba'ath Party. So at that point, the, the rebels were essentially a dead duck. The desire, of course, is also to weaken Iran, prevent Iran from having that air corridor over northern Iraq to send things into Syria, communications of the Revolutionary Guard forces that are there to attack Hezbollah and their supply line, which leads back to Iran. And they want to oust Maliki. Oh, my God, Maliki has been demonized six ways to Sunday. Uh, I must say this uh, former ambassador, Christopher Hill, has had some moments of wry humor, right, that uh, those Sunnis that he's supposed to reach out to would cut off his hand, right? They, those are, you know, hardline Sunni, sectarian, Wahhabite, Takfiri, Salafi uh, people. They're not interested in making deals with Maliki. They want him dead. So that feeling is mutual. Here, here's a good, a good example. David Ignatius, what Maliki has wrought Friday the 13th of June. And, of course, it's all the fault of Maliki. Christopher Hill points out this is simply nonsense. But behind this lurks a danger. The DMization of Maliki. Remember, thanks to W. Averill Harriman and his Brown Brothers Harriman Bush faction, they demonized no Ding Diem, president of uh, South Vietnam, killed him in a coup, and after that, the situation was irretrievable. That was the loss of the Vietnam War about uh, 10 days before Kennedy himself was assassinated. This is now going on with, uh, with Maliki. Uh, interesting that this morning, Vladimir Putin, speaking from the Kremlin, has offered the full support of Russia to Maliki, <laughs> then he he doesn't have conditions, right? Obama says, you know, we're going to help you. We'll send you some advisors, and of course, the three hundred advisors there will be organizing a coup against Maliki and doing precious little against the killers of ISIS. <laughs> so you see how it works, inside outside operation. But in any case, to save the Syrian terrorist rebels to weaken the Iranians, to control the northern Iraq airspace, to try to oust Maliki. And, of course, if you oust Maliki, the guy that they don't talk about that much, Alawi, he's the candidate. Some say Chalabi is the U.S. candidate, right? One of those curveball characters. No, Chalabi, I think, is damaged goods. But Alawi remains the, um, the U.S. candidate. And remember, this is with, with the help of Julian Assange and... WikiLeaks, because they are carefully edited CIA uh, anthology of diplomatic cables targeted Maliki, and therefore, by implication, trying to help Alawi. Uh, we've gone through the fact that Baghdadi is sporting a four-year Bachelor of Terrorism from U.S. Uh, training uh, academies in various POW camps. And remember... Perhaps even more important than the coup in Iraq against Maliki or in Syria against Assad, which this is designed to try to advance, it's the coup in Washington that is supposed to be. The coup in uh, Washington, as I was saying, is the uh, the heart of the matter. Now, the other interesting thing, 
when you see a blitzkrieg that works so well and there's so much hysteria, let's go back to the fall of France in May, June 1940. Listeners to this program have heard the voice of Annie Lacroix, her famous book, The Choice of Defeat, Le Choix de la Défaite, that the French generals who let Guderian through at Sedan along the Meuse River, those guys were pro-Nazi. And that's CORAP, C-O-R-A-P, George and Huntziger. Hunt, Z-I-G-E-R, Huntziger. And uh, these people uh, preferred Hitler to Leon Blum and the French Popular Front. So you can see, as the, the uh, Iraqi troops are saying, our generals told us to run away. We were ready to fight. They told us to run away. Those guys have been bribed by the CIA. Surprise, surprise. The CIA was bribing Saddam's generals already in 1990-91 for the first Gulf War. They trained this army. They know who to bribe. This whole thing, in that sense, is a dog and pony show. But as the comparison to May-June 1940 and the fall of France goes, even a dog and pony show can lead to historical tragedies on a huge level, right? The fall of the French Third Republic and the erection of the Vichy fascist regime as a result. And in those days, remember, it was the Cagoule at the lower level, right, like the P2 Lodge, and at the upper level, the Synarchy, the Synarchy, the equivalent of the Bilderberg uh, group or something like that as a modern uh, Synarchy. So this gives us, I think, the framework to look at ISIS. Uh, It's the it's the right wing, if you're looking at it from Saudi Arabia, the left wing is the Islamic Front and Nusra and others attacking in Syria or by now trying to defend in Syria, trying to hang on in Syria. And the right wing is where you've decided to escalate this war and expand the war. They've chosen a wider war. As a result, you've got to understand your main enemy is Saudi Arabia. We need an ultimatum to Saudi Arabia. Stop all support for ISIS within 24 hours or else. And then pepper that with some suitable threats. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio here on uh, June 20th, 2014. Now, we're very pleased to be able to go to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska and get a campaign update now this is from the front uh this is where the uh the rubber meets the road this is the main action uh and it's the campaign of Dan Burdorf of the Tax Wall Street Party someone who is eminently qualified for the United States Senate grasp of the issues and uh i must say moral prob- probity compared to somebody like Ben Sass or uh people of this type. So we want to get a report on on how the uh, ballot access is going, but also uh, we the past week we had um, Daniela Walls, we had uh, Kyle McCarthy on here talking about this network of theocratic libertarians. Sass is one of them. Brat in, uh, in Virginia, who just became prominent, is, uh, is another one. Uh, and, and what is the implication of this uh, this the network now emerging as somehow contending for control of the Republican Party in the uh, House and the Congress, but also possibly as a presidential uh, issue. So welcome, Dan. Tell us how it's going. Hey, great. I just uh, came in off the uh, street to uh, give you this report. Uh, We already have uh, 50 signatures for the day, so we got off to a great start, a nice early start. And uh, yesterday I was... Really proud to hear that I'm on the message board at the local postal union. My card's up there, and I want to tell everyone that I will roll back the 2006 Postal Accountability Act and the Hastert poison pill when I'm in the U.S. Senate. The USPS- and you know there's a danger this week that they're going to try to abolish six-day delivery, which is a death sentence for much of the economy of rural or the non-urban uh, America. That's, that's, that's too part outrageous. of the uh, dealing. No, we will stop that. We will stop that. The USPS is the lifeblood of rural America. And uh, the post office must continue. It, it must continue. It's it's in the in the Constitution. We'll, we're going to have a post office, and it's not going to be cut back. Um, we need 6,000 signatures to the Secretary of State's office by August 1st so I can get on the ballot. 
So if you are waiting to come to Nebraska and volunteer or waiting to support me, please don't wait. I need you here as soon as possible for the petition drive. You will be doing a public service for the good people of Nebraska and the people of America. Better people than I have to see this campaign succeed so they can get up and fight too. And this is, this is a campaign that's bigger than just danfornebraska.com and bigger than Dan Burdor for U.S. Senate. Okay, but it's danfornebraska.com. Yes, and thank you. If you want, if you have, uh, uh, material support, logistics, uh, contributions, that's where you want to go. And the time to do that is now, right? Thank this you very is much, Webster. Yes, critical please. Critical six-week period to get this done. And this is going to be one of the main Senate races, and it's going to be um, decisive to have somebody talking good sense, like like Dan Burdoff. Well, I need to get in that race. I need to be in there and have have this uh, platform out. We're we're continuing to gain momentum, and I want to call your attention to an article that was. Uh, written by Jerry Alitalo, called Nebraska's Dan Burdorf for United States Senate. Now, this was posted originally in May uh, 27th, and, and that's by Jerry Alitalo at onenessforhumanity.com. Alitalo writes that our campaign here is a significant part of the fight against austerity around the world. And you can see it on my website, danfornebraska.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for my newsletter to keep in touch with my campaign week to week. Um, right now, I have a great support from a small petition team of volunteers, and like I said, we're averaging uh, well over 100 signatures for ballot access each day, but we want to do better. And we need volunteers to come to Nebraska and fight the good fight. That's why I have a headquarters, so we can host volunteers. We, uh, we're not, we don't want to wait for everyone to come out um, after the petitions are turned in. We need you as soon as possible if you are coming. And, and, uh, and what tell you if, about you're, if you're a college student or something and you want to come out there, you have a place for them to crash, right? In this uh, exactly, and that this, this is really, uh, if you're thinking if you're thinking about activism or, or maybe you're thinking in the future someday you want to run, this is the place to learn how to do that because we're doing it right now. An activist, Absolutely. So it's a an actual laboratory of real grassroots, as distinct from SAS and the AstroTurf. You got it, uh, Webster. I want to tell you about a strong activist out of Colorado, Paul Kremers. He's a big fan of yours, Webster. Mm -hmm. He's coming across the border from Colorado to petition in the western city of Scotts Bluff this weekend. Now, that's the ambition we're talking about. And we've got UFA people and tax Wall Street Party people all over America, and we need them to come here to the heartland. We're looking for groups to uh, come from both coasts, and we need to, to more so that we can get past this important pe petitioning stage and into the political campaigning. I, talk to you I, I imagine that yeah. your opponents, both uh, SAS and this other, the Democrat Domino, they're, they're going to be uh, fleeing uh, any debate on the issues. But the one, one issue that came up uh, last week in the discussion yeah. of the, uh, the, the sort of uh, religious uh, confessional sectarian background mm -hmm. of SAS uh, uh -huh. and indeed of Brad, this, this anti-Catholic, uh, anti-Vatican, anti-Pope thing that okay. they have going on and what, wow. how that cuts. Mm -hmm. In a state like Nebraska, where what one quarter, one third of uh, of voters are are probably Roman Catholic. That's what we're looking at. About a, a quarter of the voters are Roman Catholic. So well, I need to get uh, these messages out. So if you can, I mean, if you can, if if anyone listening can help me get that message out, uh, that would be most appreciated because the Catholic voters here need to know that they need to know the strange uh, philosophy of this person. So I, I, I met a Democratic Party op official. Uh, just yesterday, who was stunned I was running for Senate, and he asked how I was different or better than the Democrat candidate. And uh, I told him that I had a fighting economic program to turn around the U.S. economy and wake the sleeping giant. And then he asked why I didn't run as a Democrat. And the thing is, is that Democrats think they run economic populists as candidates, and they think that they are the party of Roosevelt and JFK, but sadly they aren't showing it anymore, and they've watered it down. And let me tell you, that here in Nebraska, the voters will support more. They will support a new deal and new frontier platform. This is uh, the, uh, the this is populism. Populism is in the roots of Nebraska, and unfortunately, the Democrats aren't running economic populists. And I hope that includes that populism with out. a capital P. That's correct, sir. Yeah, and uh, and I hope they can figure it out because uh, that's what the people are calling for. I, I just talked to an old classmate of mine this week who's a colonel in the U.S. Army Rangers, 
and I asked him what I can do to help active service personnel and vets in my campaign. And he replied to me, win, <laughs> win. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that keeps me fighting and people like this and the strength of our platform. So if people, if you can help me uh, on this historic effort, please confirm at danfornebraska at gmail.com because we will be working for ballot access until August 1st. You can also contact us at Friends of Dan Burdorf, uh, P.O. Box 6584, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68506. Okay, so that's an open invitation. Let me just ask you the thing that occurs to me. I'm always curious. Sure. What's the weather like there today? Well, uh, we just broke our heat wave, Webster. So now uh, we had a low of 65 tonight. It's going to get up to in, uh, mid-80s today. But I'd like to say special thanks to Joe Johnson, who's here in Nebraska, and he was out all day petitioning in the heat wave every day that just passed. And Joe Johnson is out whenever he has time off from work. He works here right in Lincoln. He's a very good campaigner and always surprises me with who he can get to sign the petition. And I had to laugh at some of the people he turns around. I mean, one gentleman, he didn't like the platform because he wanted to end the Fed. And Joe pointed out to him that it made more sense to mobilize the Federal Reserve to rebuild our infrastructure. So this guy, this gentleman, signed the petition and was very happy to learn about the idea of using the Federal Reserve as a national bank. That's also, great. I want to give a shout-out to Brian Walsh, who is – also out every week on his own getting signatures, and he's helping us chip away at the 6,000 signatures we need. All right. So um, the word is uh, forget uh, forget Florida, forget Miami Beach, forget all these places. Uh, the forget, in, we, the we have lots of fun here, Webster. Uh, next week is going to be the last show for jazz in June in my hometown of Lincoln. Oh, and I wanted to thank, uh, uh, well, Webster, we, we just have a lot of fun. There's going to be jazz in June in, in Lincoln, and... Uh, we hope you can make it. There's also the College World Series that's going on right now. We need a team down there, so please come. Th Whoopster, thanks okay. for having me on your show. I really appreciate Dan it. And for Nebraska, come back next week. We want to report it. I'd love to. Can we go over the top and then beyond, all the way to November? See you soon. And we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Um, I would also call your attention to the Randy Credico campaign to get on the ballot in New York State. This is now governor against the Wall Street puppet Andrew Cuomo. Don't listen to anybody who says that uh, Cuomo has now reformed because of his dirty deal with the Working Families Party. That is a group of uh, trade union bureaucrats and other unreliable uh, individuals um, we have no confidence in them, but we uh, would like to see Credico get on the ballot to create some um, some problems for Cuomo and to uh, increase public awareness of what Cuomo actually represents. Uh, and, of course, Credico has been, last year, the Democratic Party candidate for uh, mayor of New York in the Democratic primary, and then all the way to November for the tax Wall Street Party. So tax Wall Street is where it's at, right? Forget Occupy, forget these failed uh, anarchist-driven experiments. It's the tax Wall Street Party. And what I pointed to about the Postal Union, this is um, the danger is that as part of various um, machinations in the Congress, they're going to try to attack six-day delivery once again, right? And this is all of this you can thank Hastert the Bastard and the Hastert the Bastard poison pill that for some reason the U.S. Postal Service has got to pay, instead of paying one year of future costs every year, as everybody else does, they got to pay seven. So the idea is that it, they, they have to put this in escrow. It means that there's a huge pot of money sitting there that they can't use. And when Hastert the Bastard's dirty Republican reactionary friends privatize the Postal Service, which is what they want, then they can grab that money. So this is highway robbery countenanced by the brigands of the Republican Party, those those despicable reactionaries. Now, um, a few more things here about uh, the, uh, the Syrian-Iraq-Iran situation. You can see... Working here, the, the, the axiom, the, the maxim that I've tried to set up, in most situations, any national state
state is going to be your ally. And in most situations, you don't want to go down the road of microstates, mini-states, rump states, failed states, warlords, uh, chaos, anarchy. The Libyan road is what you do not want. I would urge people in Scotland, forget about this crack-brained experiment of Scottish independence. Uh, you won't be independent. You'll have the Queen. You will have the Bank of England. You will have the European Central Bank, if you're lucky. Uh, and uh, you'll have all sorts of uh, troikas and other people, the European Commission, breathing down your neck. Uh, you won't have independence. You'll be a Bantu stand. You'll be a kind of subdivision of the type that was carried out in South Africa, right? Local control, autogestion, always the same thing. Cut, you know, subdivide, partition, weak, impotent, squabbling, and, uh, you know, extremely uh, inconsequential little uh, states. The fact that the British are doing this, right, the London oligarchy, is that they habitually use their own country as a show window, pilot project, and advertisement for whatever lunatic strategy they were doing. When it was Thatcher, they wanted Thatcherism. They wanted her brand of reactionary, Hayek, uh, Friedman, libertarian, monetarist, uh, Austrian school economics. Well, they, they, they put it on display there, and then that was copied by Reagan and so forth around the world. And similarly, you can take that back to um, Harold Wilson and the deindustrialized, post-industrialized society that Harold Wilson represented right in the mid, mid-60s. mid So don't fall for this stuff. Uh, right now, civilization is in an uh, extremely dangerous crisis, right? It is a an existential crisis of human civilization itself. And in that context, the nation state is one of the prime institutions that must be preserved at all costs. And therefore... Anybody who comes with secessionism and splitting, except in very specific situations, like Crimea is not to create a, a rump state. It means to join uh, Russia. And I'm sure the ultimate logic of what's going on in Ukraine is the same thing. So the people who are doing the splitting are the imperialists, right? Split Czechoslovakia, split up Yugoslavia, split up Serbia, carve Sudan. Now the, the big hue and cry, let's carve Iraq. These people, they've learned nothing. And then, of course, we've got similar plans. If you carve Iraq, by the way, uh, the Bernard Lewis plan, which is the part of the, uh, the strategy which applies to the Middle East, you look at that area, the so-called Akhvaz, right, Arabistan, the coast of Iran on the Gulf, Abadan refinery and the uh, Karg Island uh, tanker terminal and so forth, Akhvaz. And remember that that is, there's a terrorist group there. I always call them the British Petroleum Liberation Front, BP Liberation Front, because what they propose is precisely to detach that area, and it's the Anglo-Iranian oil company, otherwise known as BP, uh, that would then become up for grabs, and BP, of course, would, would be there uh, on the inside track. So it's time to think about this. I had occasion to talk uh, to my old friend Max Matsuko this week, and you can see that in Italian on his website, I believe. And I had to talk, I had to warn these people, right, these crackpots who want to have the independence of Venice and the Veneto. This is, uh, this is very sick stuff, right? This has nothing to do with the needs of working people in the world that we uh, live in. So I would warn against that. And, of course, um, we are marking day by day here the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War, which was the, the idea that the British Empire would not be allowed to divide up the great nation states, India, China, Russia, U.S., and so forth, right? Try as they, as they would. And by the way, since it's the 20th, I think in a couple of days we have the anniversary of the victory of the U.S. warship Kearsarge over the Confederate raider Alabama off the coast of Cherbourg, France, and we actually have some some paintings of that by I believe uh, Manet, uh, and those are very very interesting. And that was the beginning after the terrible carnage of the wilderness in Spotsylvania. This was the beginning of the uh, the um, attempt to uh, to 
buck up the morality and and morale in the north and uh and then proceed to to end the war. And of course, by now, Grant is in the Petersburg trenches. So the Petersburg siege is on, and that will go all the way to next uh, April. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Do take a look at Coast to Coast AM. If you're hearing this on Saturday, the 21st of June, I think I'm in the first hour of Coast to Coast uh, AM, the famous... Uh, Battle of the Alabama and the Kearsarge, the battle off uh, Cherbourg, is now 150 years uh, in the past, and it is uh, just about 150 uh, years ago, 19th of June, so it is uh, 150 years ago uh, yesterday, and you do have those... uh, uh, Manet, it's Manet, sorry. The Battle of the Kearsarge in the Alabama. Two paintings by Manet. Very, very interesting. All right, so the, the point is, though, the, the, the underlying dynamic of world history is that there should be an alliance of nation states for economic recovery, economic development, infrastructure, trade, against the forces of chaos. Now, the forces of chaos are people who have no place in the modern world. It means the Saudi royal family. How in God's name can they exist in the modern world? And, of course, the British establishment with headed up by a monarchical family, right? And the, the Russians have just uh, reminded us of the Nazi connections of the so-called House of Windsor. Uh, and then they, really there would be more Nazi connections than they, than they gave. The reason that Qatar and Kuwait and Oman and so forth and the Saudis, above all, sponsor the Middle Eastern terrorist forces is because those are the irregular armies of monarchy and uh, an oligarchy of that medieval benighted type. So what they're trying to do is to make the Middle East safe for the Dark Ages. That's the Saudi strategy. This cannot be shared uh, by the United States. So uh, interesting that Putin has offered full support to Maliki. And what it means is There'll be no conditions about Sunnis or anything else, right? He, he's offering support. He will not interfere in the internal affairs of this country in the way the U.S. always does. But the U.S., you know, a rational U.S. policy would essentially be to coordinate with Putin, as was done in the case of Syria, to coordinate with Assad. You want to destroy the bases of ISIS? They're all in Syria. Why not put Assad into a position where he would be able to wipe out those bases. And similarly, with Iran, they're obviously an enemy of these forces of chaos. Why not coordinate with them? Why not put aside these absurd uh, patterns of hostility that have been burdening uh, the entire uh, foreign policy of the U.S.? But now, two segments left. We've got to talk about uh, the Russian forums, right? And we have some... I think some very important uh, material. This was uh, the U.S.-Russia Forum. It's actually called the World U.S.-Russia Forum, Advancing a Constructive Agenda for U.S.-Russian Relations, the current crisis in Ukraine, which some see as the beginning of a new era of U.S.-Russia geopolitical confrontation, underscores the urgent need for a new foreign policy agenda that will advance both American and Russian long-term strategic interest. So this was first held in the auditorium up on the ninth floor of the Hart Senate office building here in Washington, and the second day started at the National Press Club. There was a reception at the Russian Embassy on Wisconsin Avenue, uh, and then uh, the second day afternoon at the Russian Cultural Center on Phelps Place, which is a very interesting operation in its own right. Now, as, as you know, we proceed from uh, warm support for Putin, but at the same time, free uh, tactically to uh, to make uh, important uh, uh, suggestions, let us say, and in particular, Glazyev. Let's just go through some of this stuff. Um, interesting speech from Ambassador Kislyak, the Russian ambassador. Uh, let me just state that in this in the entire two days, the constant note from the Russian representatives is 
that the Ukrainian military operation, the so-called anti-terrorism operation, must end the killing of civilians and others in southeastern Ukraine by the Ukrainian military and by the so-called National Guard. In other words, the fascists of Pravi Sektor, who have been officialized into the National Guard, this has got to end. This must end. And otherwise, hold on to your hat. Right? It's either end that or else. And it came from everybody on the Russian side. And I think this is legitimate. And we've got to remember, right, the U.S. Uh, Arms Export Act says you can't contribute anything to governments that kill their own people. Well, the Kiev fascist clique certainly does that. Um, Kislyak uh, also characteristically, he says, look, there, there is no Cold War. Uh, there is no ideological conflict between the United States and Russia. He says Russia is a normal market economy. Well, um, maybe this is not exactly a source of strength. My recommendation would be that instead of simply coming on the scene as a normal market economy, Russia should assert some key parts of its own past. You can call it the Russian system. Right? In the 19th century, we had the American system of protectionism and dirigism. We had the German system of protectionism and dirigism. And the Union, of course, was Friedrich List. And then we had the Russian system of protectionism and dirigism, which was to some degree inspired by Bismarck, to some degree inspired by Cassius Clay, and so forth. But it was the Russian system, and Russia did uh, quite well under that. And the British, of course, were apoplectic because they wanted uh, free trade and universal economic backwardness. So uh, I would say it would be good to acquire an ideological dimension, you're going to acquire one anyway, and it ought to be this one, because if you try to acquire the um, the uh, ideological dimension in social policy, that may not be so good. All right, so um, interesting from Kislyak. Russia is the third closest neighbor to the United States. The closest, of course, Mexico, Canada, common border. Russia, number three, two to three miles away up there, in uh, Alaska, where you can see Russia from your house, as everybody uh, pointed out. Uh, certainly this Magnitsky Act, this meddling, all this stuff with Politskaya, Politkovskaya, and uh, Magnitsky, this nonsense must end. Uh, this simply creates uh, ill will, and it is meddling. Uh, it's outrageous. All right, so... Um, Let's then point out, I think the, the, one of the important speakers is um, Professor Stephen Cohen, Russian expert, Princeton, NYU. You'll remember I, I criticized his pro-Bukharan point of view going back to the, um, the 1980s. But now we have an important common task, which is to organize a resistance against a new Cold War. So Stephen Cohen was there with his wife, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the owner of the nation, influential leader of the left liberal faction in New York. And what, um, what Cohen had to say was that uh, he wanted to put it in, uh, in uh, dramatic terms, and I think he's correct, that uh, this is now the worst climate between the United States and Russia since 1962. Cohen believes that the new Cold War is already there, and among the alternatives, he says, it could be that uh, Ukraine is, uh, is carved up successfully or other forms of um, salutary neglect, but what he sees is the immediate danger of tactical nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons being used in Ukraine. I've been saying this since 2004. It's the most dangerous real estate in the world. Polish NATO troops coming in from one side, Russian troops coming in on, on the other side. Russia has nuclear weapons. Polish troops can call on the NATO umbrella. And you have nuclear World War III. This must be avoided. The damn fascist clique in Kiev is not worth World War III. That's the bottom line. Back in a minute. Welcome back to uh, World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarp here in Washington, D.C. So... The speech by Stephen Cohen at the Hart Senate office building 
danger of the use of tactical nuclear weapons in this uh, crisis. I would take that absolutely seriously. And then he goes on to say the foes, the, the opponents of a new Cold War, which has somehow been uh, you know, declared, proclaimed with an ukaz. We never got to vote on it. Uh, the, the elite seems to be united in a, in a, uh, a, a you know, raving anti-Putin fit is what he's pointing to. Um, but he says the, the foes of the new Cold War are few and they are uh, isolated. Uh, and he complains, of course, that he personally, Cohen, has been uh, attacked and slandered. I uh, I would frankly not give too much time to this if I were uh, Cohen, right? I would spend more time on what should be done, right? Stodjelat, I think, as he pointed out at one point, right? The famous question: What should be should be done? Um, he talked about the fact that during the Cold War there was the U.S. Committee for East-West Accord, and that was backed up by people like Donald Kendall of PepsiCo and Watson of IBM and others. But today the opposition is isolated, and um, you just don't have uh, that uh, muscle behind it. So he recommended that uh, what we need is heresy against the emerging orthodoxy of new Cold War and and confrontation. We also then had Ambassador Matlock, who had been Reagan's ambassador, a kind of a State Department uh, you know, a guy from the Reagan administration. He's also quite um, quite reasonable, and uh, he doesn't think there's a Cold War. I actually asked him, do you think we're in June, uh, July 1914, he does not think we are. His, his big thing was, oh, if you go to, you know, Idaho or Iowa, nobody knows anything about what's happening with Russia, and therefore there's not going to be uh, a big uh, confrontation. Unfortunately, 1914 shows that what the little people know or don't know is not, um, not uh, relevant all the time. Now, um, so I, I think those those were were significant. Now in the uh, the afternoon session, I asked <laughs> these people. Uh, this was a different panel now, right? The morning panel was Cohen, Lev Gold, the former head of the Harriman Institute, um, and and others. Uh, then in the afternoon, we had uh, Matlock. We had a guy called Leonid Gozman, G O Z M A N, and this is the Union of Right Forces. This is the voice of Boris Nemtsov, extreme neoliberal, you know, looting economist. And Wayne Merry, former State Department and Pentagon official. Um, Guzman, one of the Russians there on the first day, called for the military defeat of Russia. He said he wants the Ukrainians to militarily defeat Putin. And he said, but he said... He opposed the annexation of Crimea, but represents 1% of Russian opinion. But nevertheless, there he was. The Union of Right Forces, Sayus Pravich Sil, that's Gozman, and Mary. Now, what I wanted, of course, was to ask about Glaziev. What do you think about Glaziev proposing exchange controls, capital controls, taking over the central bank, using the central bank to issue long-term low-interest credit for trade, infrastructure, Industry, agriculture, mining, scientific research, and so forth, if the West pulls away their uh, financing. One of the things that came out of the discussion was you can get loans from Russian banks, but it's going to be 15 to 20 percent interest. If you want to get a decent rate, you've got to go to a Western bank operating in Russia, and, um, and, and there uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So there's a lot of stagnation creeping in. Now, this is obviously where, where the Glaziev proposals ought to occur. Let me then record what Gozman said. Gozman repeated, this is the Nemtsov guy, Glaziev is crazy, Glaziev is crazy, <laughs> Glaziev is crazy. Wayne Merry said that he wishes ardently for the victory of the Kudrin, neoliberal faction, over Glaziev. Uh, so I was able to get a rise out of these guys, and what they showed 
was a venom against Glaziev was at least as much as their venom against uh, Putin, which was, of course, uh, considerable. So that was, I think, an important moment. Now, the second day at the National Press Club, this is also quite interesting, a teleconference, in other words, a closed-circuit television hookup between the National Press Club and Moscow, and here we had Sergei Mironov, the head of the political party, which is sometimes uh, translated as fair Russia, just Russia. What it means is equitable Russia. Maybe we can call it that, because it doesn't mean just Russia and nobody else, and it doesn't mean fair in the sense of, you know, pretty, but equitable. Okay, so Mironov was there. Sergei Stepashin, former prime minister of uh, Russia. Uh, Lieutenant General Yevgeny Buzhinsky, International Cooperation Department, Ministry of Defense, retired. Vladimir Lukin was the Russian ambassador here in uh, Washington, D.C. in the early 90s. Fyodor Lukyanov, uh, important uh, writer, Russia in Global Affairs. So that was the the panel. So there was a back and forth between uh, Washington and, and Moscow on that. And one of the interesting things from uh, Mironov was there are no important problems in the world that can be solved without the agreement of the United States and Russia. I think this is exactly right. And that would be the basis in a rational political environment for a condominium. That is, the United States and Russia agree to maintain stable conditions and put the brakes, dissuade, put the brakes on and dissuade aggressive moves. In other words, tell the Israelis and the Palestinians, here's the solution, you take it. Tell China, Japan, these rocks will not blow up the world, so be informed. And on. And then Saudi Arabia, the two, Russia, Moscow and Washington, tell Saudi Arabia, stop supporting these killers. And so on down the line. And this is what you see. This is the the inherent dynamic of the world against which these uh, lunatics in the State Department and the uh, British Foreign Office are are striving. Uh, so this was uh, this was also a uh, very interesting thing. And of course, there's the indignation on the Russian side. You know, what what do you have to say? They wanted to know about that attack on the uh, Russian embassy there in uh, in Ukraine with the foreign minister engaging in obscene invective against Putin and against. Um, Russia. Now, you can see what's going on, right? The, um, the Russians have cut off gas to Ukraine, although the gas continues to flow, presumably for Western Europe. But we know the Ukrainians, as uh, incorrigible thieves, will skim off, siphon off the gas that they want. And at that point, the, Europe- the Western Europeans, if they're really the cretins they pretend to be, will then blame Russia for the fact that the gas is not arriving. This is what the State Department hopes. This is what Newland fantasizes about. Um, then there was, uh, on the, the second day of this conference, on Tuesday, the blowing up of a key gas pipeline. Now, there was a redundancy in the system that allowed a workaround, but otherwise that would have cut off gas. Now, who had talked about that? Yarosh, the fascist madman of the right sector, had proposed that one key weapon for the Ukrainian heroes that he says he represents, is to to cut off the the, uh, the gas. This morning, Poroshenko is proposing a unilateral ceasefire, and uh, NATO, Falk, Falk of War, Rasmussen, says there's a new Russian military buildup along the border. Again, the common line of the Russian participants is there must be a halt to these military operations. And, of course, we have this awful James Kerchik Meet the anti-Semites, truthers, and Alaska Paul at DC's pro-Putin soiree. And in the course of this, he gets around to me, after Cohen, and ahead of Ray McGovern. You get me. So we'll talk more about this, because there was a, some stuff at the level of Minnesota and Alaska, who have tried to get around the uh, lunatics in the State Department and assert an actual economic interest and a common interest with the Russians uh, and how they fared. We'll go into that next week. So um, check, remember, Coast to Coast AM Saturday night, and above all, top...